Hello class, Dr. Bauer's Office Hours here again. I know that I said last time we were going to cover the trolley problem next, and we are going to cover that next time. But first I wanted to cover some objections to Kant's ethics as we covered them in the previous lecture, the one where we presented a summarized, simplified version according to O'Neill that focused on the second formulation of the categorical imperative. So here's some objections to Kant. One, what is immorality according to the second formulation of Kant's categorical imperative? Two, which two ways can we object to the second formulation of Kant's categorical imperative then? Three, list three sorts of cases which show that immorality does not require treating someone as a mere means. Four, List three sorts of cases which show that treating someone as a mere means does not require anything immoral. All right, just four study guide questions this time, and as always, you may want to follow along with a pad of paper and a pencil or a laptop or something in order to take notes with, maybe a canvas and a paintbrush, I don't know. So if you recall, Kant's ethics, as we covered it, focused on this idea that you should never, ever, ever take someone's ability to reason and choose for themselves and use that as a tool for your own personal goals or for your own ends. In other words, you should never, ever, ever treat humanity as a mere means. You should never use people like they're just tools, in other words. Kant thinks that to use people in this way is what immorality is that the essence of what it is to do wrong is to treat someone like a mere means, right? From this, we can extrapolate a couple of claims. First, that according to Kant, any example of treating someone as a mere means is immoral. Secondly, that any example of immorality has to be a case in which someone is treated as a mere means. Treating someone as a mere means requires immorality, and immorality requires treating someone as a mere means. They go together. It's an identity. So, if we want to object to Kant's ethics, or at least to his conception of what's immoral, we can find counterexamples. We can try to think of a case of something immoral, but it's not an example of treating anyone as a mere means. It's just immoral in some other way. That would show that Kant is wrong. Or, we could think of some example of treating someone as a mere means that isn't immoral. That you could actually use someone in a way that isn't morally bad. That would also show that Kant was wrong. Two types of counterexamples. Two types of exceptions to Kant's claim about immorality. Let's start with the idea that you can have immorality without treating someone as a mere means. Here are three sorts of cases. First, consider the phenomenon of natural evils. These are things that just occur in the natural world without any deliberation or any intention behind them. They just happen, and they're bad. And they're not just bad in some, aw shucks, disappointing way. They're bad in that what they accomplish is morally bad. The loss of life and the perpetuation of suffering. If you consider cancer, or if you consider an earthquake that kills millions of people, that would be devastating. And that would not be anyone's intention or action, or at least it wouldn't have to be, but it would be morally bad. That would be an example of something that's morally bad that did not involve anyone using someone else as a tool, using someone else as a mere means, right? The case of the devastating earthquake, or the devastating virus, or the devastating cancer, those are all examples of how something morally bad, something immoral, can occur without anyone being treated as a mere means. It's just bad because of the suffering and death it causes, not because anyone was using anyone else. O'Neill points this out when she says that in order for immorality to occur, there has to be intention, according to Kant. And if you 
focus on those cases where there seems to be immoral stuff but no intention, that looks like a way of objecting to Kant. So there's our first sort of case of immorality without treating anyone as a mere means is the case of natural evils. Here's another case of immorality without treating anyone as a mere means is suppose that you give someone a whole lot of dangerous responsibilities. Dangerous responsibilities. You give them responsibilities that make their life more dangerous. As an example, suppose I give you 15 machine guns just because I want you to have them. I trust you. I believe you are responsible. I'm not trying to use you. I'm not trying to manipulate you. There's nothing I want you to do with them. I just think you should have them. You're trustworthy. Have these 50 machine guns. Is that a bad thing to do to someone? To just give them a bunch of dangerous weapons because you trust them? I mean, it doesn't involve manipulating them, or at least it doesn't have to. You might just think, nah, I like you. Here's 50 Siberian tigers. Enjoy. What's wrong with that, it seems, is that you raise the risk of harm. When you distribute a bunch of guns or a bunch of tigers to people, you increase the risk of harm in the community. It's a kind of moral bad which doesn't involve tricking anyone or manipulating anyone, right? Suppose you were just of an honest mind and you just honestly wanted to give people tigers because you honestly trusted them. You're not using anyone, you don't have any ulterior motive, you just trust them and want them to have tigers. I mean, it's in addition to being foolish, it's wrong. It's morally wrong, it seems, but it doesn't involve treating anyone as a mere means. It doesn't involve secretly manipulating anyone or using them as a tool or using them as a way to get what you want. You just want them to have tigers because you like them and trust them, right? That's, that's uh, something that looks like it's wrong, but it doesn't involve treating anyone as a mere means. Finally, consider the phenomenon of being a moral saint. This is a idea that's written about by the philosopher Susan Wolfe. A moral saint is someone who always exceptionlessly does exactly what morality requires and never ever shirks even the slightest bit from moral duties, no matter how small or how frivolous seeming they may be. If it's morally correct to buckle your safety belt, then they will buckle their safety belt every time, all the time, no matter what. If it's morally correct to brush one's teeth, they will always brush their teeth every time, no matter what. And what's more is that if morality requires them to help other people behave morally, they'll do that too. So think of the moral saint as someone who is correcting everyone around them to make sure that they all behave morally. On one hand, that's good, we could use a bit more of that in this world. But on the other hand, suppose that they're very, very, very specific, myopic, exceptionless, and constant. So that there's no letting up, so to speak. Right? Oh, you spilled a bit of coffee there, you should probably mop that up so the people who work here don't have to mop that up. Oh, you forgot to put it in your chair, tuck in your chair. Oh, you didn't actually tuck your shirt in when you should be facing them. Oh, you should have said this, where every little thing... In other words, imagine someone whose dedication to morality was a source of distress for others. It caused them pain and suffering. Does that make it bad according to Kant? No. Remember, categorical imperative is not about pleasure or pain or feeling good or suffering or any of that stuff. No way. The categorical imperative is about whether you're promoting someone's freedom to choose for themselves or whether you're using them as a mere means. And the moral saint is not using anyone as a mere means, even though they're being obnoxious. Or at least that's the way the objection would go. That there's something morally bad about being a saint in this way, but it's a moral bad that doesn't involve treating anyone as a mere means. That's another way to object to Kant, or at least it's a third sort of case that involves immorality, but no treating anyone as a mere means. On the other hand, we might consider some cases where you do treat a person as a mere means, you do manipulate them, you do treat them as they're just a tool to use for some other end, but it's not immoral. If there were a case like that, a case where you're manipulating someone or using them to get a goal, right, 
without their consent, but it was okay, there was nothing wrong with it morally, that would also be an objection to Kant. And here are three sorts of cases like that. The simplest one, the easiest one, is a surprise party! Suppose you throw someone a surprise party. Quick question, can you consent to a surprise party? No, you can't. If I ask you, hey, I'm gonna throw you a surprise party on Wednesday, is that okay with you, right? If, if I were to ask you that, then it wouldn't be a surprise. Even if I don't specify a date, if I just tell you I'm gonna throw you a surprise party, there's a sense in which I have rendered it no longer a surprise. In order for it to really be a surprise party, it has to be done without their knowledge, which is to say, without their consent. A surprise party is a plan of action which in principle someone cannot consent to. It is textbook definition of something that should be immoral according to Kant. But we know it's not immoral to throw someone a surprise party. So that seems like Kant gets it wrong. Here's a case where you are using someone as a mere means, but it's not immoral. Case number two, helping someone who is stubborn and refuses. Suppose that one of your friends really needs to watch the level of gas in their car and they just don't do it. And because they drive so recklessly all the time and they're so forgetful, they're actually dependent on you filling up their gas tank when they're not noticing. If you try to get it, get their permission, it won't work. They're stubborn. They're like, ah, I'm fine. Don't touch my car. So you have to do it without their permission. You're helping them. You're making sure they stay safe on the road and don't get stranded, but you're doing it without their permission, without their consent. You're deceiving them. Is that wrong? It's a sort of case where you can argue that Kant gets it wrong, that the overall good of the result is worth violating their consent. A third sort of example of this is more extreme, and it's called Kant's Axe. There's a link to a video explaining it down in the doodly-doo below, the description. Here's how the case goes. A murderer comes to your door. They're looking for your roommate, who is at home. They've got a gun, and they're ready. Well, originally it's an axe, but we're going to update it. They've got a weapon, and they say, hey, is your roommate home? If so, I'm going to kill him with this weapon. Is it okay to lie to them? Can you lie to someone to save a life? Is it all right to be a little dishonest if it means saving someone else's life? It seems like it's okay. It seems like you could say, oh, no, they moved out and save your friend's life, your roommate's life, right? That seems like an okay thing to do. The fact that you're lying does not mean that that whole situation is wrong, right? It's a little lie, as we might say. But Strictly speaking, according to Kant, that's wrong, right? You cannot use someone as a mere means ever. It's never permissible to use someone as a mere means, and lying to someone is a plan of action to which they cannot in principle consent. Lying to someone is treating them as a mere means, so you can't lie to people, ever, no matter what the result, even if it means saving someone else. Remember, Kant does not say that an action is okay to do as long as it keeps the most people alive. He says that you can never, ever, ever manipulate someone else. You can never do it, no matter what the goal is. So, this is a case where it looks like common sense says one thing, you can tell a lie to save a life, but Kant says another thing, that you can never, ever lie, even if it means you would save a life in doing so. Now, if it sounds like I'm being unfair to Kant, I should mention historically that Kant did take up this position. On, in an essay called On the Supposed Right to Lie from Altruistic Motives, Kant explicitly defended that if a murderer came to your door looking for a friend who was there, you would have to tell the murderer the truth. And if the murderer killed your friend, that would be the murderer's responsibility, not yours. It would be on them, not you, because you didn't commit the murder. You were just someone telling the truth, like everyone should. What do you think of that reasoning, hey? Well, check out the video in the description below, and next time we are going to look at the trolley problem. Thanks again for watching. See you next time.